Today I'll be talking about the use of uh, Helogen as a new technology for soybean insect pest management. So to kind of start off, what is Helogen? Helogen is a highly specific naturally occurring virus. Uh, it's Helicoverpa armedura, uh, MPV, here MPV is what we call it. One of the important things to remember about this virus is that, it is, like I said, it is highly specific. It will only control one uh, specific pest, which is the corn ear worm, uh, is also known as boll worm, soybean pod worm, uh, has several different names. Uh, some, it will also control the tobacco bud worm. So if you think those old heliothion complex, that's the only species that this virus will control. For this talk, since we're talking about soybeans, we'll call them pod worms. Uh, but just know it is uh, the corn ear worm or, or cotton boll worm is the same uh, animal. So with that, with it being uh, highly specific, it's very safe on beneficial arthropods and insects. It will not, not harm any uh, honeybees, things like that in the field, uh, completely safe on them. But with that, it's also completely safe on other pests. So if you have soybean loopers in the field, if you have uh, uh, stink bugs, something like that, will have no activity on those insects. It will only affect uh, pod worms. This uh, virus is produced by a company called Ag Biotech. It's originally an Australian company. They moved to the U.S. in the uh, early mid 2000s. Uh, they're now in Dallas Fort Worth area uh, where they uh, do produce this virus here in the U.S. It's a group 31 uh, insecticide, so that as a midgut paratrophic membrane disrupt disruptor. Uh, essentially, the, the virus infects these worms and uh, ruptures their midgut, and, and the virus begins to leak out and, and kill the worms. So, one of the, the most important things about this product is when do we use it? So, our threshold for helogen is much lower than it is within, with synthetic chemistry. We're going at a threshold of two to five small pod worms per 25 sweeps. So, what do we call a small pod worm? Ideally, uh, we want to use this product uh, when the population is around a quarter of an inch in length. Uh, we can go up to a half an inch, but when you start getting any larger than that, up to three quarters of an inch or larger, uh, we're, we're going to want to use synthetic chemistry. And the reason for that, there's a couple of them. Uh, one is, you know, these worms are going to continue feeding until they die. So those you know, particularly in the first three to five days after infection, they'll continue feeding. As worms get larger, they, like humans, they eat more, so they do more damage at that point. So it's important that we control these worms before they get into the fourth, fifth, and sixth instar, where they really do a lot of feeding. Uh, a lot of these uh, caterpillars will do almost 80% of their feeding in the last uh, two instars that they go through. So it's important that we kill the worms before they get that big. Uh, the labeled use rate in soybeans is anywhere from 1.28 to 1.6 ounces per acre, so that the low rate is a get one, one gallon of, of uh, the virus will treat 100 acres, a gallon to 100. And that's gonna run you anywhere from $5.56 to $6.88. So it's a pretty economical option for us. Uh, just keep that in mind. When you're comparing it with a lot of synthetic chemistries, uh, that costs more, you know, we're putting out a product that doesn't quite cost as much, so we can't exactly uh, have the same expectations of, of this virus as we do those chemistries, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. One of the, the big questions that we'll go ahead and address now is can I tank mix this uh, virus with an automatic fungicide? And the answer to that question is yes. The answer to that question is also no. It really depends. Are there pod worms in the field at the time of application. If there are, then you can absolutely go ahead and mix the virus in with your, uh, with your fungicide and uh, get, get an infection started. If the virus isn't, if there are no uh, pod worms in the field, there's nothing for the virus to infect. Uh, we only have about 24 hours of true residual in the field, so Essentially, uh, that spray uh, will not infect any worms and the virus will not propagate later in the season. So now, now we're looking at, you know, what do we expect after we make an application? As I said, the, the expectations for this virus are going to be a little bit different than the expectations of synthetic chemistry. So for the first, uh, you know, the day of to about three days after application, larvae are going to seem pretty normal. 
uh, you, you will not really be able to see a lot of difference between a, an infected larvae or pod worm and a healthy pod worm. However, once we move up to three and really between five and eight or 10 days, that's when we really start to see some differences uh, with the infected larvae. One of the, the kind of odd things about this virus, but, but neat nonetheless, is that when infected, uh, the pod worms tend to move up towards the sunlight. So when they do that, they're coming up to the top of the uh, soybean canopy, which actually makes them a little easier to collect in the sweep net. So if you, a lot of times, if we come in at five or seven days application, after application to try to uh, see the effectiveness of our spray, we'll catch more pod worms at that point than we did uh, prior to applying. And like I said, that's very common. Uh, these, these pod worms are moving up to the top of the canopy. Uh, they'll begin to sweat. Uh, you'll see uh, very small water beads on, the back of, on their backs, and that is essentially the virus starting to leak out of their bodies. Uh, the larvae will also start to feed less. You'll see a little bit of etching often on top of leaves in the top of the canopy. Uh, they'll start to shrink a little bit. And then just before they liquefy and, and die, they'll adhere themselves to the, to the leaf. So at that point, once the, the larvae liquefies, it releases millions of viral particles into the field, which can serve as a source of secondary infection for populations of pod worms that were not present at application. So here's just looking at some of the uh, early symptoms that we'll see in those first three to uh, five days maybe. Uh, larvae will tend to look swollen. We we'll call that a cigar-shaped uh, larvae. Uh, the sweat beads you see there on the back of that, uh, that caterpillar. And then also they'll lose control of their hind legs. So if you've got one in a sweep net and you put it on your hand, you can kind of mess with them a little bit and, and they're just not quite as active as normal healthy uh, pod worms are. So here's some, uh, some images of the later symptomology once the larvae have begun to uh, adhere themselves to the leaves and liquefy. You see it looks pretty gross, uh, but this is all just viral particles being released back into the field that are going to serve as a source of secondary infection. And I will note in these pictures, these are all large larvae. Hopefully in your field, you, you won't see uh, that Images like this make for really good pictures to show uh, the symptoms, but hopefully in your field, you've uh, sprayed this uh, product on very small pod worms and you won't see uh, caterpillars this large dying in your field. They'll die much sooner than this. So I'm not gonna get into a lot of da uh, data slides and kind of bog this talk down, but I did wanna show this one slide uh, shared with me. It's a summary of 22 trials conducted in the Mid-South with university and uh, private research uh, people evaluating helogen against the chemical standard uh, used for pod worm management in each of those different areas of, across the Mid-South. And what you see is helogen performed pretty well. Uh, it was a there's a little bit of a lag in performance uh, depending on what, what rating you look at. It's maybe not quite as good as the chemical standard uh, at any individual rating, but but really over time, it, it provides effective control. And that's something that I've mentioned when you refer back to the price of this product. Uh, it's, it's not, it uh, doesn't cost as much as some of these other chemical standards, so we can't always expect the exact same uh, out of it at, you know, at, at three days after application. We need to give it a little bit more time and be patient with this virus. So some of the keys to success with Helogen, uh, scouting and identification is critical. You know, we've talked a lot about the size of larvae. They've got to be uh, hopefully a quarter of an inch, no longer than half an inch, or uh, to get the most effective uh, efficacy out of the spray. Uh, again, if larvae are, or the majority of the larvae are greater than three-fourths of an inch, you're going to want to use a different product or at least maybe tank mix with something that will <clears throat> provide immediate protection of the crop. Uh, scouting and identification are on there again because it, I just really want to drive home, drive home how important that is that we've got to uh, make sure we're looking at pod worms and not velvet bean caterpillars or something like that and, and make sure we've got a good understanding of the size of these larvae when we spray. Coverage is very important uh, on the label. Uh, Agbitech uh, lists a minimum of three gallons per acre by air. Uh, they, I think they'd like to see probably closer to five gallons per acre if, if possible. 
and by ground rig they're wanting at least 10 gallons per acre. It's very important that we get a good uniform uh, coverage in the first uh, initial infection and, and having a good, uh, good GPA is, is critical for that. Another thing to remember is product viability. Uh, so this product is it's a living, uh, living organism, so it's important that we don't expose it to uh, very hot temperatures. Also try to keep it out of direct sunlight. The virus is uh, protected in what's called occlusion bodies. These are, are uh, essentially casings that, pr that protect the viral bodies, and they are rapidly broken down by UV light, heat, and pH. So it's, it's important to keep it out of direct sunlight try to keep it as cool as we can. And if we need to add in a buffer or an acidifier uh, to the tank, if our pH is gonna get above an eight. So uh, here's just again looking at, so these are some of the different caterpillars that we may find in the soybean field in Tennessee. And uh, you know, green clover worms, velvet bean caterpillars, you know, soybean loopers, sometimes if we're not looking close enough, we might just say, oh yeah, we got pod worms and go to spray, but I just really want to drive home this fact that uh, this product only works on the pod worm. It's not going to control silver spotted skippers. It's not going to control painted lady larvae, only pod worms. So we have to make sure that we're, we're scouting and identifying uh, the proper insects at the time of application. So since uh, this is a virtual field day and we're Fortunately, not able to have a lot of question and answer uh, time for this. I kind of came up with a couple of different questions that are pretty commonly asked by people who are, are new to this virus and even people who have a lot of experience with it. Because uh, it, like I said, it, it is very different from our normal chemistry. So the first one is, what's the residual of this product? Well, the residual lasts about 24 hours if you consider a true residual. As I've mentioned, it is readily broken down by UV light, uh, high temperatures, and high pH. So we, we generally, the general rule is we get 24 hours uh, on the leaf before all of the uh, occlusion bodies are, are uh, degraded and the, uh, the virus at that point dies. So that's why it's very important that we have larvae in the field when we spray, uh, because you've got about 24 hours to get good initial infection uh, to, to try to establish the virus. At that point, when, when larvae that were infected in the original 24 hours die, they then release more virus into the field, which can serve as a source of a, a secondary infection or, or a, a third infection, whatever you have. But it, so that's why it's very important that we have uh, worms in the field when we spray. So here's a slide just kind of uh, demonstrating that residual, uh, air quotes, residual control. You'll see a little bit of a lag in, uh, in control if uh, another flight of uh, pod worms come in and, and eggs hatch. Uh, you see at uh, seven days, it looks halogen is uh, similar to the chemical standard. Then at 14 days, there's a spike there in the population. Uh, that was when a secondary hatch, those are all small larvae in the field. And then uh, at 21 and 28 days after application, uh, the virus takes back over and uh, we, we get control. So it, it just takes a little bit of patience, a little bit of time, you know, walking the field and, and to get comfortable with it uh, before you, you really see these results. Another question is on rain fastness. Uh, which I think is pretty common for uh, even a lot of uh, synthetic insecticides at times. Uh, so for this product, basically we need it to at least uh, dry on the leaf. Uh, on the label for Helogen, it's, it states to avoid applying Helogen if heavy rain, which they deem greater than 0.4 inches per hour, is expected within one hour after application. So it's, it's very important that we, we get uh, dry on the leaf before a, a heavy rain so we wanna make sure that uh, the pod worms are actively feeding at the time of application. And really a light rain can even help spread the virus to the lower parts of the canopy where it's a little bit harder to get penetration. And that can uh, be very beneficial for us in controlling worms uh, on pods lower in the canopy. Uh, and also the use of MPV is, uh, is MPV is much more effective in, in high humid uh, warm temperatures. So if you do have a, a, a light rain or something coming, that can uh, even help the efficacy of, of the virus. 
another question, does it have to be stored in a cooler all the way to the field? So this is something that, that gets brought up a lot with, you know, talking about trying to keep it out of uh, hot temperatures, try to keep it out of the sunlight. Well, you know, do I have to have a special cooler when I, when I buy it at retail or wherever I pick it up from until I get it to the field to put it in my sprayer? And no, you really don't. Uh, you know, you need to be careful with it. Uh, you can read here the different uh, storage regulations that Ag, Ag Biotech has studied and, and their claims for how long the virus will uh, remain viable at, at different storages. But really within about a 36 hour period, uh, the virus seems to be pretty stable, uh, anywhere from 77 to 95 degrees uh, temperature. It is important, you know, like I said, to try to keep it out of the sun if possible. You know, just try to avoid those uh, long periods of direct sunlight on the, on the uh, virus. So then lastly, can I spray this uh, in strips across the field? I know, you know we've talked, you've, you've probably heard some talk about how it spreads and the virus really can spread a long way, uh, either on its own or with help from you know, beneficial insects, wind, rain. Infected podworms can move it uh, up and down the, the plant canopy and it, it can spread miles uh, without spraying it. However, you know, as we've talked a lot about, those first 24 hours are critical for establishing the virus and, and getting uh, prolonged activity weeks after the spray. And in order to do that, we need a good homogeneous uh, application. So for that, we're, you know, we really need to go ahead, spray the whole field. Uh, it, it can take the, the virus days or weeks to move uh, effectively. So you, you're giving up a lot of control and a lot of initial uh, infection if you're spraying strips across the field. It's, it's very important that we, we try to spray the entire field with this uh, virus. So some of my uh, just closing comments, you know, this, this talk we, we uh, focused on soybeans, but helogen also can be used in sorghum to control uh, corn earworms. Just keep in mind the price and, you know, remember the expectation that it, it's not going to behave the same way that synthetic chemistries do. It's, it's going to be a little bit slower. Uh, it's, it's not going to be as fast, so just keep that in mind. Uh, it's very important that we, we go at the right size. We need uh, larvae to be ideally a quarter of an inch, really no larger than half an inch uh, for, for optimized uh, kill. And do remember that they are gonna continue feeding until death. So if you need immediate protection, uh, you may wanna uh, go with a different chemistry or perhaps tank mix something uh, that will provide some immediate protection and keep the uh, keep a little bit, some larvae in the field for the helogen to uh, infect. Uh, but if, if you're really in a pinch, you do not want to use this product due to the slow acting nature of the kill. So thank you for, uh, for joining in today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about helogen, you can reach out to me. You see my, my email there. Also, Dr. Scott Stewart at Tennessee has a lot of uh, experience with this product as well. And we'd uh, be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you.